I just thought I'd show you a poem by a very famous physicist by the name of Dirac. It says, age is, of course, a fever chill that every physicist doth fear. He's better dead than living still when once he's passed his 30th year. There's a certain amount of truth to that, but not too much. Is this working, really, everybody here? OK, good. Um, so I, uh, I, I made a, a standard mistake uh, a few months ago when they wanted a title for my talk. There's a lot of planning that goes into these meetings. And uh, I had a standard title, and they said, no, we want something really exciting. So I made up another title. And uh, then came the time when it was close to giving the talk, like a few days ago. And then I had to write a talk to fit the title. And that's a mistake. I don't advise that to anybody. But uh, in case you've forgotten the title, I have it here. Uh, Stop the century. We're, we're in the 21st century, so. The uh, plea is to stop the 21st century uh, because we're not ready for it. And of course, uh, there's a lot of metaphor, but I call your attention to uh, this little chronology of uh, <clears throat> our world to give you a set the scale. Uh, the birth of the planet, as you can read, was about 4.6 billion years ago. It's the creation of the solar system at that time. The first living uh, bacteria, about 4.2 billion years ago. More complicated bacteria, a little bit later. Multicellular organisms took, you know, billions of years uh, from the start until the uh, uh, recognition of the existence of, mul uh, uh, of the dates in which they, they were formed. Hominids, about 7 million years ago. Uh, Homo sapiens, that's us, perhaps 100,000 years ago. And they kicked around for uh, almost 100,000 years, and then somebody discovered agriculture. Probably lots of people discovered agriculture in different parts of the world. But that's only 10,000 years ago. And the first evidences of real science, which took place <clears throat> in ancient Greece about 3,000 years ago, Modern science, which begins with Galileo, Newton, and so on, only 400 years ago. Uh, I remember flying on the first Pan American jet that flew across the Atlantic. I think there were four in service, and that was in 1958, so roughly 50, 50 years ago. The internet I'm not sure of, but it's somewhere between 15 years old, maybe 10 years old. I've, Anybody here might know better than I do, but it's uh, certainly not very long, although many of you probably grew up with internet and uh, can't imagine a world without internet. Try. I know it's hard. So now we have a problem of trying to uh, imagine what the next 100 years, that's the rest of this century, would be like, or maybe 50 years, be hard enough. What discoveries and inventions will bedazzle and maybe even torment uh, the graduates of this school, IMSA, and their fellow citizens? Just imagine 2100, 100 years from now, when we notice that the acceleration of, of uh, changes in our world, uh, it's a nonlinear effect. It's probably roughly exponential if I plotted it on graph paper. And uh, so that what happens in the next 100 years might be equivalent uh, in some measure to uh, what happened in the last four, five, six hundred, maybe thousand years. We don't know. But to try to uh, estimate that, we know, realize is going to be very hard, maybe unimaginable. And the thing that drives this relentless progress in recent times from perhaps two or three hundred years ago to present time is science and technology. And the technology more recently 
within the last hundred years, the technology is based on the science. Uh, so there is an enormous amount of things that we can expect to happen, and I'm going to try to wave my arms and estimate some of these things. Why? Because uh, here at IMSA, we're in the business of education, and we want to make sure education is relevant. That's one reason. And another reason, the reason that I will uh, emphasize, has to do with something we call public science literacy. The, uh, the general understanding of science by ordinary people, not scientists, but somebody you meet anywhere, storekeeper, postman, policeman, uh, English teacher. How much science do they know? How much should they know? And my argument will be uh, that the uh, general state of science literacy, knowledge about science in some well enough to function in a world that's crowded with science and technology, uh, that is, we're in, a, we're in bad shape. Uh, there are many people who, whose profession it is to measure science literacy. One uh, particular guy who was not far from here, he used to work at, out of uh, uh, DeKalb, northern Illinois, used to come up with numbers that the American public is 96.3% illiterate. Or maybe it's 93.6%, some number like that. Uh, I was told that 82.7% of all numbers are made up, so we shouldn't worry too much. <laughs> so what I want to do, my argument will be sort of simple. It will be, well, to try to uh, judge the, the pains and anguish of uh, the present situation where people in general are 95.7% scientifically illiterate uh, as measured by uh, Mr. John Miller and many others who go around and ask people questions like how long does it take for the earth to go around the sun or uh, why is it hot in the summer and cold in the winter, things like that. Uh, and uh, judge from their answers the state of literacy. So we'll try to uh, understand uh, uh, how this uh, plays out in the 21st century. And of course, the title of my talk tells you what I think, that uh, we're not ready for the 21st century. Now, not only will I list the, uh, well, I will list uh, some of the expectations we have for the 21st century, that's always fun especially because <clears throat> they can be, and will be, so wrong. But there's another list we can make, uh, which has to do with uh, things that might slow up that progress. Human conflicts, prevalence of violence, increasing fragility of technological societies, as well as the lethality of technological warfare. And then from that, we'll emerge with a more sobering estimate, if we knew how to fold that in, as to how humanity will fare in the next 100 years. It's an open question as to which list will produce the greater concerns for safe passage of our children, our IMSA graduates and their children, through the 21st century. But, you know, physicists are optimists. Optimism reigns, and we try at least to understand the arrows of change uh, so we can design strategies for the advancement of humanity. That's, that's our job. Uh, if we're going to prepare for these enormous changes in the 21st century, it's clear that uh, we have to make haste. And do we have time? Uh, I might uh, consider a metaphor. Suppose that uh, some of the astronomers uh, and NASA people decide there's an asteroid heading for Earth. They do careful calculations, and uh, increasingly uh, they hone in on an estimated time of collision, and let's say it takes two years. And then the question is, is it time enough to react? What are the possibilities? You could put a multi-megaton fusion bomb on a Voyager satellite and destroy the asteroid. But will that work? Maybe the debris uh, now made radioactive will still hit us. Can we perhaps land on the asteroid and nudge it into a new course? That's a possibility. Do we have time to consider quantitatively these and other solutions? 
Can we stop the asteroid while we're thinking? And then the question is, can we stop the century while we plan a safe passage through our projections? The metaphor doesn't work because uh, success in the case of the asteroid will depend on the skills of a relatively small number of experts and presumably the rationality of a small number of world leaders who will collaborate to save the Earth. However, the plan for advancing of humankind with all the promises and perils of the 21st century change, uh, requires a popular consensus and therefore a popular grasp of the issues. There are many, many problems we'll come to where uh, you will see that we can't trust experts alone, we can't trust wise leaders alone, and uh, uh, that there has to be a responsibility uh, to listen to a, a popular voice in these issues. We don't have to belabor the state of science ignorance. Uh, I told you about the 97, whatever that number was. Uh, normally in international commissions in which I'm on, you get bitter arguments between uh, different nationalities, each one insisting that his population is more ignorant than the other. Uh, experts tell us that, uh, tell us about this ignorance, about facts that are not known, but also, more ominously, an almost uh, complete lack of the discipline and ability to follow a sequential logical argument that requires more than just one or two steps. There's enough data also to assure us that college graduates participate strongly in these discouraging uh, surveys. There was a Royal Society report, Science Education in England and Wales, sobering in the conclusions that the consequences of science literacy are not only vocational for the poor people uh, who don't understand, or professional even, but there are even more substantial losses why such ignorance or illiteracy is hazardous, how it impedes social and economic progress, and what it does to make certain individuals feel alienated and uncomfortable, and why such literacy has such a large implication for society as a whole. These are the issues we want to address. However, to make things easier, to look ahead to the 21st century and to argue that whatever failures we reap because of this illiteracy today will pale in significance compared to the plausible expectations of what's coming in the next few decades. So let me uh, give you a list of uh, uh, inventions because what's going to happen is that a physicist is going to make predictions and I want to show you credentials of physicists making predictions. So we look at the uh, <clears throat> more reliable predictions of physicists. This is our track record, our track record collectively, uh, because essentially physicists have had a huge influence in the production of all these things, TV, radio, radar, x-rays, transistors, microelectronics, computers, lasers, nuclear weapons, decoding of the, d decoding of the DNA. Yes, physicists had a lot to do with that medical diagnostics, internet, and World Wide Web. I could make a longer list, but this, is, this gives you a, a sense of what uh, physicists do. And if we generalize physics, if we include chemistry and molecular biology, shh, don't tell anybody, but we can call them, for the moment, applied physics, uh, we can all use um, the only technique we have is to extrapolate these, this kind of inventiveness uh, knowing how these things work and try to apply this with some, some amount of optimism, some amount of realism, bearing in mind that the next 20 or 30 years may bring us the equivalent science and technology of the whole 20th century. Things may go faster than we estimate for two reasons. One is that our present base of scientific knowledge and technological capability is vastly more powerful than it's ever been. And the other thing is uh, obtained by looking at a classification of all of the broad categories of knowledge we have. They can be divided into three factors. Matter, that's things, you know, that you can touch sometimes and know about. 
mind, that's thinking, and life, that's biology. We rapidly learn how to make these things work together to vastly accelerate scientific and technological progress. Uh, there's an interesting book by physicist Michio Kaku. He calls these things the pillars of science which were erected in the 20th century. And what's characteristic of today's science is the increasing power of cross-fertilization of these broad categories of knowledge. Matter. Matter deals primarily with quantum science developed in the period of 1920 to 1930. That gave us a broad tidal wave of scientific discoveries, uh, still fruitful, as fruitful today as ever, dealing with atoms, molecules, nuclei, and materials. Mind is the accumulated efforts of psychologists, neurologists, artificial intelligence experts, computer scientists. The technology ranges from functional magnetic resonance imaging, which is revolutionizing brain research, to the frontiers of computer design. Today, of course, 10 million transistors can fit on a fingernail. And very soon, microchips that cost pennies will enable us to deploy millions of intelligent systems all over the place. So you'll refrigerator will talk to the uh, uh, grocery store about what's missing and so on and so on. Some of you have seen some of these things. Maybe uh, one of the things I'd like to see is a plug-in memory that goes somewhere in the head, maybe not too obvious. Uh, that would be helpful. And I personally would like to have a delete button <laughs> so I can clear the mind of irrelevant intellectual garbage. I think it was a physicist, Wolfgang Pauli, who uh, uh, enunciated the notion that, uh, that uh, sometimes intellectual knowledge is a hindrance to creativity. When he was 18, he wrote a definitive article on uh, theory of relativity. When he was 30, he clutched his head and wailed, ach, he said, I know too much. <laughs> Life, the discovery by biologist uh, Watson and physicist Crick using X-ray crystallography diffraction data of physicist Rosalind Franklin spurred a revolution in genetics and molecular biology. So embedded in these three pillars are the great 20th century discoveries of quantum mechanics, relativity, plate tectonics, Darwinian evolution, and molecular basis of DNA, and the Big Bang Theory of the creation and evolution of the universe. Potential for further advances come when we combine and focus the power of these pillars. Now let's look at some of these uh, 21st century things. And I'll make a list here so we don't leave anything out. And I took a, a number of topics practically without any systematic study. But um, before I list these things, uh, there's a very interesting metaphor invented by Sheldon Glashow, a theoretical physicist. He, he pictures an alien visitor, let's call him Arthur, who uh, comes down to Earth and he's in a kind of a, a park and he sees uh, people playing chess. And he watches the chess game and he watches the chess game carefully for so many uh, days, and finally he gets to understand all the moves, how the pawn moves, how the pawn can take uh, uh, a bishop, uh, how the knight moves, all of these things, the power of the queen. Uh, finally, he really understands all the moves. His next step is to become a grandmaster chess player. And that, of course, is a much more difficult job. And so, in, in a sense, uh, the metaphor I'm using is maybe extreme, but it says that perhaps the 20th century, we've learned the moves, and uh, in the 21st century, we're going to make a transition from an amateur chess player to a grandmaster, from observers of nature to choreographers of nature. This is part of the projections we're trying to make. So in, in medicine, there are standard uh, extrapolations usually include major advances in control over cancer and heart disease and arthritis, autoimmune diseases, and so on. Progress on human longevity is also expected. Uh, I'm sort of somewhat interested in that. 
in fact, uh, this is a good place to illustrate the, uh, the way medicine works by talking about the four doctors who went duck hunting. And uh, they decided they would take turns. There was a, <clears throat> a general practitioner, an internist, a surgeon, and a pathologist. And the first shooter was the general practitioner. He had his book of birds on his lap and saw a bird flying over and looked at the picture and said, my God, that's a duck. But by the time he grabbed his rifle, it was too late. The duck was gone. The internist knew ducks. He didn't have to use a book. And when a bird flew over, he looked at the bird and he said, I'm sure that's a duck. Let me listen, let me listen. Oh yeah, it quacks like a duck. And then he aimed his rifle, too late. The third bird came over and the surgeon shot the bird. Feathers and everything flew all over the place. The bird was splattered and he went, the surgeon went to the pathologist and says, go see if that's a duck. <laughs> Comment on specialization. <clears throat> uh, other things, computers. Well, computer is something called Moore's Law, which tells you how fast computers grow. They double computer power every 18 months. Uh, somebody estimated that that'll work for the next 10 or 20 years when uh, finally uh, you must run out of Moore's Law because uh, the size of components, which is getting smaller in order to um, satisfy Moore's Law, uh, the size, when it gets down to the size of atoms, then it doesn't work anymore in the, in the normal sense of computers. So new technologies will have to place, replace silicon. Optical computers, molecular computers, DNA computers will certainly enable extensions until one vast promise, uh, which may very well happen in the 21st century, or maybe early in the 21st century, something called quantum computers. Quantum computers are a totally different uh, kind of computer. Uh, so much so that for some problems, it's already estimated that they can be one billion times faster than any computer we can now assemble. Uh, so this would make a major change, uh, again, unimaginable influence if such a thing were to come to pass and if it were useful for a reasonable number of algorithms. There is in all this the ingredients for impacting human behavior. Uh, employment is influenced by this economics, both the national economics and the personal economics. Robotics will surely replace all non-thinking jobs. And the moral of that is in this slide. We don't have to go into the details, but the notion is that increasingly employers uh, require uh, employees who can solve problems, who have critical thinking skills because all of the routine jobs will certainly be done by some kind of robotics. And uh, in fact, uh, with the new computers we're talking about, uh, robotics uh, will also do a lot of thinking. They could play awesome roles in decision making. They could be factory managers, transportation supervisors. And then there are new technologies alongside that, uh, sort of joined to it, things called nanotechnology. You can read books about the fabulous promises of nanotechnology. For example, if you want to make some furniture, uh, instead of growing trees to supply the lumber for furniture, one could build the furniture molecule by molecule. The smallness of the components is compensated by the high speed of the assembly. So more 21st century changes, environmentally benign energy sources must be available, probably before 2050. These may require skills about which we can only speculate, or if we're lucky, some of these fusion programs may fool us by saying, my God, the 50 years we've promised have passed, and yes, this thing works. And we could have, then we have to solve the large engineering problems of deploying fusion reactors all around the world. Uh, disappearance of cash is an interesting idea. I, proposed that many years ago because if we have no cash, probably the streets get safer and I don't see how uh, the drug trafficking problem can continue if we have no cash, if everything is, is totally computerized. Software is another thing. Internet expansion. 
I'm sure that very soon you'll be able to sit at home, call down every movie ever made, dubbed in every, any language uh, that you want, and the same for books, which you can call down, translate it into any language, all of this sitting in your living room, and call in any music, which is presumably not translated. Space exploration may produce, uh, yes, people on Mars and even on some of the moons of Jupiter. The technology that, is, uh, that we have to add is not, not uh, presumably, according to the experts, enormously difficult, but, you have, but the expense is, and therefore you need motivation. Maybe it's important to uh, mine the helium-3 in the lunar soil. Maybe there are other things that we can learn and acquire by this kind of thing, but the motivation has to be there. We don't know about that now. Education will be revolutionized by many advances. Uh, for example, uh, courses could be uh, done on internet, television, and uh, the courses that you could download or look at or participate in would be given by the best possible teachers, maybe even Harvard professors. I don't know if we can go that far, but uh, progress in, uh, in cognition science and in neurosciences will also advance the process of human learning. And then human biology. Uh, research may lead to procedures that could extend human lifetimes. That's been speculated about. Uh, you would then become, uh, you know, one could imagine uh, extensions of 20, 30 percent. Now, one of the criteria is that the quality of life would have to be uh, satisfactory within that extension. Then there are issues of uh, the social and economic consequences. If we now would put into some monster computer program, what are the effects of extending lifetime, social security, and all of these other things, jobs? Uh, most of the time, the results are, in a, are disastrous, but that doesn't mean we can't adopt to that. So you'd have lots of chronicolo chronologically advantaged people. <laughs> I like that. It's like Woody Allen who said, he seeks immortality not by the movies he makes, but by not dying. The structure of computer-based commerce, banking, and transportation, which uh, we're already into very deeply, renders industrial nations vulnerable to serious disruptions by small numbers of techno-terrorists. This raises the uh, issue of international security in an age when terrorism can flourish, especially if huge gaps between the poor and the rich continue to increase. And then there's decisions on the balance between absolute homeland security and civil liberties. And uh, there again, there must be popular consensus. So. For this and many other reasons, citizens must have some grasp of science, some grasp of risk estimation and probability. Sadly, if the weather report says there's a 50% chance of rain on Saturday and a 50% chance of rain on Sunday, there's a 100% chance that it'll rain on the weekend. Right? Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, to sum up all of these things, let me quote from Ed Wilson, E.O. Wilson, a Harvard biologist who writes very deep books on biology. Early in the 21st century, says Wilson, let me in fact show it to you at the same time. New biology will present the most profound intellectual and ethical choices humanity has ever faced. We will be able to modify how our genes interact with the environment to produce a human being and tinker with the products at any level, change them temporarily without altering heredity, or change them permanently by mutating gene and chromosome. Humanity will be able to take control of its ultimate fate if we choose we can alter not only the anatomy and intelligence of our species, but also the emotive and creative drive that compose the very core of human nature. Now, if that doesn't provide motivation for popular science literacy, I don't know what will. And if the ability to cope with and profit from all of these advances is not enough motivation 
for improving the state of knowledge of the general public, all the general publics, we have to recognize that our population, perhaps already unsettled by the pace of technology we have today, are succumbing in frightening numbers to islands of false security like radical fundamentalism, psychics, fortune tellers, astrologers. Uh, I'm a cancer, so I don't believe in astrology. <clears throat> healing by hands and other alternative medicine doctors, pyramid knife sharpeners, UFO abductees who will tell you everything that happened to them up there, perpetual motion inventors, cold fusion salesmen. Collectively, we call these things junk science, but the belief in them is enormous. I refer to a book by Robert Park called Voodoo Science, where he relates that uh, it's been a close call several times uh, in which the U.S. Congress has uh, barely avoided legislating against the laws of thermodynamics. That's frightening. The ignorance of science uh, on the part of the leaders uh, of the nations is, the, is, is one of the major problems we have. The antidote to all of these popular poisons is a calm, rational approach, which reminds me of the fact that my grandfather died with a smile and a calm demeanor, not the horrible screams of terror of his passengers. No, that's a joke. You get it? See? All right. This, uh, okay, various vastly incomplete, incomplete and maybe even misleading glimpse of what wonders and terrors the new century may have in store for us should at least convince 87.9% of the audience that all citizens, all residents, all high school graduates must be equipped with the capability of living comfortably with this frantic pace of change. If science and technology continue to drive the social and economic and cultural changes, to be ignorant of science would, in my view, be fully equivalent to being ignorant of any other, of that other literacy, the ability to read and write. There's another dimension to all of this as we plunge into this roaring ocean of change. It should be clear that changes that we know how to make may not be changes that we should make. And then the issue becomes who decides? The scientists and engineers who did the inventions, the industry executives whose capital paid for the work, government offices who funded it. How about the society, the voters, the citizens whose lives might be adversely influenced? In our history, the last possibility is often dismissed, and sometimes, I must say, for good reasons, because I don't think the population today is capable of wise decisions in some of these science-oriented uh, problems. I have two examples of uh, popular debates. One had to do with uh, uh, adding, fluorine, fluor fl adding fluorides to drinking water. Uh, it was one part in a million, it was tested, it was carefully researched, uh, and, uh, but there, were, there was wild opposition to this by people who were maybe with good reason suspicious of governments uh, doing something that is supposedly good for them. It turned out that uh, the fluoridation, fluoridization passed and it had, had, had the, the uh, uh, benefits that uh, were predicted. It was a good thing. Another example was uh, something called the supersonic transport. There was a proposal that government would uh, assist the, in funding uh, 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 the growth of supersonic jet planes that would uh, travel at about 60,000 feet would, uh, and therefore uh, would increase transportation by a huge amount. It would be a, a joint operation of the airplane manufacturers and the government. And again, it was a, a wild, wide debate uh, on the subject, and the environmental people were aware that hundreds of supersonic airplanes uh, in the fragile stratosphere might have enormous environmental uh, negative effects. Um, and uh, the debate was wide, and the way the debate went is that the scientists who understood the physics and the biology and chemistry of the situation, went to the public, and uh, the public was uh, alerted to this, and the, uh, 
effort failed, and uh, we now know that, in fact, with the uh, economic failure of supersonic transport that in the uh, Concord case, that we also saved a huge amount of money in addition to environmental problems. Today, uh, there are all kinds of uh, issues that require decision making uh, and public, I think, uh, consensus. Things like genetically modified foods, are they safe? Stem cell research, should that be carried out? Uh, should we outlaw tobacco? Maybe we can't afford to outlaw tobacco because all the states have been bought off by hundreds of millions of dollars of tobacco money. Global climate change, is this a real effect? Is it an effect produced by humans? Organ transplants, many environmental problems, ozone, acid rain, loss of biodiversity, clean air and water, and pristine uh, the preservation of pristine forests and other land uh, elements. National defense, including homeland security, the whole problem of population. All of these things, I think, require a popular idea and therefore a popular sense of what's the science, not that they can have a detailed understanding of the science, but have some general notion of uh, how the science goes and be able to listen to a debate and decide whether uh, one argument is uh, based scientifically or not. So the issue for democratic society, will we have an educated citizenry that by reading, watching, listening can have an opinion on these issues and make their opinions known. As we try to indicate the issues in which science and technology deeply impact public policy are certain to increase dramatically in the decades ahead. Yet today, all decisions on how to deal with these issues are in the hands of science ignorant legislators and equally ignorant executive branch decision makers. Yeah, they can call on experts to advise, they can get the National Academy to do a study, they have a capable science advisor, but most policy issues are controversial, sometimes because the science isn't clear yet and not resolved and you need more data. And even when the science is very clear, economic and political costs weigh in. This enables presidents and governors and mayors to ignore the science, however ominous the threat, in favor of the politically more comfortable decisions. Scientific illiteracy of the voting public is not only a shame of nations, it subverts the democratic process. Okay, so I'm making the case that all citizens, all high school graduates should be science literate and let me recall for you that the history of science education itself is, is also very young, maybe 100 years old, maybe a little more than that, and has gone through a number of phases. I'm clearly interested in the literacy of all students. My purpose is not to increase the number of young people going into science, although I'm not uninterested in that. Our educational system has always been multi-purpose. We need our children to read and write and be numerate so they can function. We want them to know history. Uh, let's see, I know, uh, I know I'm, I'm partly good in history. I know all the dates. I just don't know what happened. <laughs> they should be able to, say, locate Iraq on a map. Apparently, in one test, nobody was able to do that. To know literature, to know something about the music and the arts. We have a strong commitment to general education. My obsession is with science as a liberal art and ultimately how science influences history and literature and is in turn influenced by them. The school experience fortunately is not the only way our students learn, fortunately. There are museums and science centers, there are newspapers with science pages, a decreasing number unfortunately. There's TV which has some good channels, a few, Nova and Discover Channel. Uh, occasionally movies, I remember I have four good science movies I know, October Sky, Contact, Goodwill Hunting, Beautiful Mind, they're, they're, but that's not many. We have already motivated a need for science literacy with a strong emphasis on the need for savvy, science savvy citizens and voters. Savvy is a good word, it comes out of street savvy where the street looks very chaotic, but if you know something about it, you know where it's safe to walk and what it's safe to do. By implications, we stress that there's a need 
uh, for science knowledge or savvy in a large number of non-technical employments in law, uh, where technology continually presents law with new problems like DNA identification, suppressed memory, all kinds of things. Other professions, journalism, business, advertising. And the desire for workers with critical thinking skills is universal. Then there are personal decisions we have to make as members of our family, and we listed a lot of those things. And let me jump now to uh, uh, some of the other important virtues, I think, of some knowledge, a general knowledge of science, uh, in addition to uh, questions of eating engineered, genetically engineered foods, or smoking cigarettes, or exercising, or should I let my sister marry a physicist? That's an important issue. I like to add another bonus that derives from good science education, and maybe the most meaningful. Science is a way of thinking. The learning theorists call it a scientific disposition. It's quite different from scientific thinking. Scientific thinking is for scientists, but a way of thinking is for everybody. It should persist long after all the formulas and equations of high school courses in chemistry, physics, and biology have been forgotten. The quality that help in voting in the voting booth, this quality can help in the voting booth, but it also serves all day when you're reading a newspaper in the morning or watching the evening news and discussing life's major problems with your children. John Dewey, in 1930, articulated this science way of thinking that I've been wrestling with for uh, several years. What he said was, again, let me... find it. So John Dewey is one of the major thinkers uh, in American education. Responsibility of science cannot be fulfilled by the method that are clearly are chiefly concerned with self-perpetuation of specialized science to the neglect of influencing the much larger number to adopt into their very makeup of their minds those attitudes of open-mindedness, intellectual integrity, observation, and intense testing that their opinions and beliefs, in testing their opinions and beliefs that are characteristic of the scientific attitude. That's, I think, what has to be taught. And if you have the scientific way of thinking, then what you've done is to make a major influence on willingness to change opinions as a basis of new evidence, search for the whole truth without prejudice, have concepts of cause and effect relations, make habits of basing judgment on fact, have the ability to distinguish fact and theory, and of course to be blessed with freedom of thought and speech. Now there's one final supplement which would touch those students who are fortunate enough to have had the right kind of teacher, like the English teacher who cried in front of his class as he explained the sonnets, or the art teacher who rapturized over the wisdom glowing in the face of one of Rembrandt's paintings, they the rabbi. Science is nothing but an elevation of the human spirit as become familiar with the discoveries of, say, Copernicus. I have a picture here. Very famous recent picture from the Hubble Space Telescope. Discoveries of Copernicus and Galileo, Garwin, who follow the incredible discoveries of our new age astrophysicists. The cosmic microwave background, the measurement of the Hubble constant, dark matter, dark energy, mysteries as profound as any we've ever faced. When we learn that we live on a routine speck of matter a planet, part of a standard solar system in no particular place in a galaxy of 200 billion suns, which itself is one of trillions of galaxies, we begin to have a, a kind of eure eureka feeling of the beauty of the world in which we live. Science has displaced humans from the center of the universe, but the universe is full of beautiful structures following some grand plan that is slowly being revealed. And surely the discovery that stars millions of billions of miles from us are made of the same chemical elements as our sun is a profound discovery. Then too, if our science courses are treated as part of the liberal arts, we will learn something about the scientists themselves 
as IMSA did in producing a biography of uh, 15 uh, scientists, which is available for sale. <laughs> it's only, I don't know, 40 or 50 dollars. But and we will learn that the same science goes on all over the world, that kids in Calcutta and Nairobi and Athens and Chicago have the same chart on, in their chemistry rooms, the chart of the periodic table of the elements. The knowledge behind this amazing chart was developed by Europeans and Chinese and Arabs and Egyptians. The knowledge of science belongs to all of us. Thank you. Okay, we're going to uh, take uh, maybe 10 minutes or so of questions. And uh, since I have the microphone, Leo, I'm going to start. Um, we know that little children are born natural scientists. Uh, they wonder, they explore, they try to figure out how the world works and how they can put things together and take them apart. And as they go through school science, some of that interest and passion and energy is dissipated. Um, if you were given all the money you needed and you could pick anybody you chose to go with you on a massive marketing and public relations campaign, just like the, uh, Treasurer O'Neill took Bono with him for AIDS, if you could take anybody with you, uh, who would you take, why would you take them, and what would your message be? for science education in the world? Wow. Gee. I have a message. The message is easier. Uh, in fact, I think it's very easy for people who have some experience with education, uh, sensitivity, and, uh, and a certain amount of wisdom to know what to do. We do know what to do. The problem of getting it done is the hard part. And so what you need is someone standing behind you who has the power of conviction, who can say, this is what we have to do. And then I will fill him in, or her, on uh, <laughs> what it is uh, that should be done. You know, what it is that should be done is very clear. We have to revise our science curriculum from Head Start, or pre-K, through 12 and maybe 14 for students in college who are not majoring in sciences. We have to look at it all very carefully and look at the curriculum and look at the training of teachers and look at the technology that's not used very wisely but can be used much more wisely. There's a, there's a prescription for things. So what I need behind me is someone with awesome clout. Uh, I don't know if there is such a person. At one point some years ago, I chatted with Colin Powell, who was a fellow graduate of City College of New York, and we were at a ceremony. And and I asked him if he would like to be, was he interested in leading a non-governmental uh, group of CEOs and university presidents and uh, scientists and educators who would uh, try to make up for the fact that we have a decentralized educational system with 16,000 schools going in every which direction. He was interested, and, uh, but uh, then a funny thing happened to him. <laughs> And so, uh, but th that's the thing you'd really want. You'd really want someone uh, that, comes out so that comes from outside the education and even the scientific community, but that has uh, uh, automatic, you know, great, a great deal of, uh, of, of clout in the general, in the public's eye. Uh, I don't know who's next after Colin Powell. I didn't have anyone else on the list. The closest I could come to someone like that is uh, Mr. Alan Greenspan, who some of you may know is the chairman of the Federal Reserve and a man who's in, in control of our economy, which is not doing so well, but he's a very wise man anyway. And he's very interested, I found out, in science education. He thinks it's crucial, for, picks his words very clef, carefully, and he says it's crucial for the future of the nation. So he might be a, a convincing person. Only one? <laughs> Could I take a little army? <laughs> Uh, because I think, uh, in some sense, you need you need the the moral, ethical, and uh, uh, respect, huge respect 
of the general population. It's very hard to make these changes. Every time you, uh, you look for some fairly modest change, you find an incredible number of obstacles in your way. And you need someone that's, uh, that has the power. And since in our, in our country, it's very difficult. We don't have a ministry of education. We are decentralized, and therefore, we have to convince everybody, teachers, parents, legislators, um, school officials, uh, you name it, uh, and that's, it's very hard. So it's a good question. You ask the right question. I haven't given you a perfect answer. Excluding as much as possible the religious aspect, what do you think is the scientific future of cloning? Of cloning. Cloning. The question was, what is the scientific future of cloning? Well, uh, I think that from my reading, technically, it is not uh, a difficult, uh, not an insuperable thing. I'm sure that we'll know how to clone uh, living things and maybe for many things this will be useful. If you're milking cows and you want a cow that gives a lot of milk and you find out what the genetic problem is and then from then on you clone, you, you, you can uh, increase the production of milk. That's you know, same thing with other foodstuffs that you think about. When it comes to cloning of humans, that's very much uh, an ethical and moral issue that you have to face. And again, it's very complicated. The question is why do you want to do it? Do you have a motivation to do it? Because as, uh, uh, as we heard, uh, the, uh, uh, the ethical and moral issues are very serious. Once you clone something, you've begun a process which can be inherited. You, you have a very good chance of losing control of it. So uh, my own feeling is that at the moment, all the, uh, essentially, all, essentially the biological community is opposed to cloning and will not do that kind of uh, uh, will not suggest uh, that this thing be done. And I think that's a wise decision. You have, to be, you have to show that the benefits are enormous and show that the risks are under control. But the environment there can be very successful. I'm sorry? In farming. Yes. In farming, it looks good. And uh, I, don't see any, I don't see any objections in the farming business. And uh, certainly the cloning of sheep that happened, what, five, six, eight years ago hasn't uh, destroyed the world in any way. And I think, I think that shows promise of benefits. Hi. Um, I'm a junior here. And um, I just had one question. Um, you've discussed the numerous possibilities of science. Um, do you think that there will be an acceleration of solutions to world issues such as famines in Zimbabwe? Oh, okay. Like this? Okay, <laughs> sorry. Okay. Hi, I'm a junior here. And I was wondering, um, you've discussed the numerous um, possibilities of science. Um, do you think that there will be an acceleration of solutions to world issues such as famines and as famine, yeah. The trouble, I think the problem there is one of uh, uh, distribution. Uh, I don't know of any predictions for worldwide famine, but there are certainly predictions for famine induced uh, by war and uh, when, when, when you can't plant and uh, the whole society is disrupted. There's also, of course, natural disasters like droughts. Uh, and with uh, the, uh, our climate uh, patterns changing so rapidly, largely, I suspect, uh, due to uh, global climate change and due to the existence of greenhouse gases, there may be more dangers of, of uh, uh, disruptions in normal climate. And if this climate is disrupted, famine is possible. On the other hand, I think it's unlikely that the world uh, cannot produce enough foodstuffs to solve the famine problem by uh, compassion and uh, consideration that, uh, and uh, the distribution of foods from places that have good harvests to places that don't have good harvest. This is, I think, a decision that uh, governments have to make 
and the governments can be uh, uh, convinced by people who have enough understanding of these things uh, to insist that uh, if we have surpluses that we uh, distribute these services uh, to places where they have shortages. It's unlikely, uh, but not impossible, I suppose, that there'd be a worldwide famine, that we somehow couldn't grow foods anywhere. I think the agricultural uh, research is, has been thriving. I was assured by an economist that every dollar invested in agricultural research produces a, a dollar a year in income uh, to you know, general income. So I do think that we can produce enough foodstuffs for the world, and we have to make sure that it's distributed in a in a sensible and compassionate way. Um, the latter part of your talk uh, sort of led me to get the impression that the real problem is not science, education, and literacy per se, but the lack of the scientific way of thinking, the, some of the points of which you, you had on one of your view graphs. I'm, uh, and it's, it sort of seems to me that children who, by whatever means, acquire that way of thinking will then gravitate to science and demand the good education and so forth. Uh, do you have any, uh, and um, it's, it seems that this way of thinking is not explicitly taught or even discussed, or at least it's very rare for that to happen. Do you have any ideas as to how we can, you know, get that way of thinking into more people's heads? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think, in fact, uh, what we're, what I happen to be working on, uh, rather, with some effort, is concentrating, st you have to start somewhere, and I concentrate on the high schools, because I think it's in the high schools where the most egregiously uh, silly things happen in the learning of science. But I believe that you can uh, re rearrange and think carefully about a sequence of science instruction in the high schools and math instruction that has to go with it. And it uh, clearly will benefit if uh, after that starts that you go back into middle school and uh, redo the science curriculum there if there is a science curriculum in middle school. Some places have it, some places don't. So it matches seamlessly. But I think that if you then um, are aware of the fact that you want to uh, uh, make sure that concepts uh, are deeply understood by students, whereas you know the mathematical mathematical uh, ability to solve problems may not be as crucial as the ability to grasp concepts clearly, and if the science that you teach includes a heavy dose of process of how do, how does science work in, in each of these subjects, in physics, in chemistry, in biology, in uh, uh, geology. Uh, you can tell stories of how we learn these things. You can tell stories of how science goes wrong. You can tell stories of cold fusion or other sillinesses that happen in science. And we could, what you have to teach is not only the content of science, but almost as much the process of science. And I think if you do that, you can write down a curriculum, which is not very hard to do, in which the end result of that three-year exposure plus uh, electives taken in the fourth year, or concurrently in the first three years, will give rise to just what I thought, a science way of thinking. Because what you'll remember later on is the process. How did it work? How does it work? Stories. Uh, biographies of scientists and how they succeeded and what it took to succeed in science. So my, you know, the whole idea of a, of a sensible curriculum is one that instills this science way of thinking. It preserves it, you'd like to preserve it from way back when the kids first enter school. And so that's important too, but you can't start everywhere at once, you have to start somewhere and then hopefully grow out and you also have to fix the colleges, where science, again, is taught to non-science majors uh, in a very poor and sloppy way. Uh, fundamentally, it's a conspiracy of the universities and the uh, students who are not terribly interested in science to, uh, to get over this requirement in some way. And only very few schools, good ones, University of Chicago is an example, that treat the science requirement seriously 
because they want their students to be educated people. So I, I do think that uh, the science way of thinking can be a product of our high schools. I'm convinced of it. And I have uh, five publications to prove it. <laughs> Thank you. That was a good program, uh, huh? Dr. Letterman, my question is actually somewhat similar. Um, first of all, you mentioned how you want to create a curriculum that has more of a foundation on the scientific method. First of all, how do you create your curriculum so it doesn't take away the, foc the focus that there is now on uh, the literary methods? And also, what exactly do you think will happen for on the curriculums in the future? First thing, first thing we need is some of this, these longevity pills. <laughs> but uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, pretty optimistic, that's what physicists are, that uh, the curriculum will change. We're trying to make the most you know, obvious changes and ones that are, well, they're more dramatic than the others. But if we can get the, uh, 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 the revised sensible curriculum and then in, in, within each of the disciplines, you put in enough of the process, and it begins to work. And in the, we know about between 200 and 300 high schools in this country that are doing things with a sensible curriculum. And the results are, uh, are spectacular uh, in the uh, cultivating the interest of students, not, science, not future scientists, but ordinary students, in taking more science and being interested in it. So it's something that works, uh, but the... Uh, the, the, the interesting thing is that the curriculum that probably most of you who are not IMSA people have gone through is 100 years old. And anything that lasts 100 years must uh, illustrate an awesome resistance to change. And so we have an enormous job to do is to uh, produce a change. You know, lots of people want to wake up in the morning and do what they did yesterday. They want a brand new thing. They have to learn new things, new ways of teaching, new ways. Uh, they have to communicate with their uh, fellow teachers in a much more intimate way. There are a lot of things that happen on the way to uh, something which then eventually starts working, and then, then uh, the teachers themselves uh, derive a great deal of pleasure from this. But it's, a, it's, it's not an easy thing. I can't predict uh, how fast this will go. Uh, two years ago, the city of San Diego adopted this new curriculum, which sounds encouraging. We'll see what they're doing. A few other cities, state of Maryland is uh, discussing this very uh, avidly now. So here and there, there are, it, the pot is stirred, but uh, how it will go, uh, I don't know. And a lot of it depends on uh, ugly things like money. It takes some money. We believe. In order for this program to work, for example, teachers have to have at least, I think, 20% of their time in professional development, becoming better teachers. Well, that costs money. Uh, in, a, in an ideal world, the federal government would share these new expenses with the state, and that would really do a lot, uh, both for the retention of good teachers, for the training of teachers, for the continuous improvement in teaching. Dr. Letterman will be uh, here uh, for a, a fair amount of time this evening to continue a Q&A. So let's just deal with the people that we currently have in line uh, because we have two more presentations yet this evening and then I know that he will answer other questions uh, when we get out into the reception. I have a statement and a question. Science investigates the invisible aspect of reality and art portrays the aesthetics of reality. In your presentation, you left art out. Can you explain why you did? Uh, a, it was too long already, but <laughs> the, uh, I did uh, uh, talk about the humanities that includes art but I also specifically, somewhere I'm pretty sure, I, I meant to cl say if I didn't, that uh, art, music, literature, you know, uh, history, all of these things are, are uh, 
pools uh, of knowledge, and I want to include science along with them as part of what we generally call the liberal arts, because science interacts with art in many ways. Uh, I happen to be working with a colleague at Fermilab writing a book on, uh, on symmetry, in which, which really uh, has a significance in science, a deep significance in science, as well as in art and architecture. Uh, music, all of these things are important pieces of knowledge and it'd be very elegant in our high schools when the physics, biology, and chemistry teachers are talking to each other, say Monday morning, to plot the strategy for the week, that every few weeks or so they invite in all the other teachers to talk about the connections, the connections between physics and history. I mean, physics changes history and history changes physics. Literature, the influence of science and literature, all the connections between the humanities and between the science and humanities. That's, uh, we've got to close this two cultures gap and certainly, uh, and especially uh, I have some experience with, uh, with art in, uh, in children in, in primary schools where art and music are very good handles on approaches to science. Um, my question is a little bit more specific. Um, you mentioned a, a cashless society in the future, and I was wondering uh, what you believe to be like the effects. What the effects would that be of that would be on like the average person compared to like the elite or the financially? Um, how like having a cashless society? How that would affect? Yeah, how that would affect the world? Uh, I don't think the cashless society, uh, uh, I, I think it's sort of across the board. It's, it's in a way, you can look at it as uh, right now, if, you know, if I asked everybody to take all the money out of their pockets, somebody would have $10, someone would have 12 and they'd have some plastic. We're almost a cashless society now. But think about a society in which cash didn't exist. It's an interesting idea in that if it didn't exist at all, then all your transactions would somehow be be computerized. You might have smart cards or, or a thumbprint which authenticates that when you buy, you pick up your newspaper, you put your thumbprint down and some bit clicks somewhere and you're debited and the newspaper guy is credited. So uh, suppose that works. It has one uh, interesting uh, complexity to it in that you uh, give up whatever, <laughs> some of your privacy because now all those transactions are now recorded, and that's uh, a lack of privacy. But we don't have much privacy now anyway. It is a problem. I would uh, handle it by making uh, you know, the, the penalties for invasion of your privacy very severe. Uh, but if I put that aside, it'll suddenly make all the streets safe. No, nobody's going to hit you over the head because there's, you have no money, and uh, presumably, after a, a robber has three watches or four watches, uh, he's not going to look for another watch. There may be barter arrangements and some crime will go on, but I think cash is the most fantastic invention for facilitating crime you can think of. Uh, so this doesn't, this, this I think is non-denominational and bipartisan. I think it's a, an interesting idea uh, uh, which, which would, uh, if, if it can be implemented, uh, would make our, uh, our cities much more pleasant to live in. It would eliminate bribery and drug trafficking and all sorts of things, complicated in very, very serious ways. So that's the, the, to me, is the benefit of that. And you don't have to remember to take your wallet all the time. Just take your thumb. <laughs> okay, um, my question is, what effect do you think war in current world relations um, has upon um, scientific literacy and the progress of scientific development? The question is, what is the effect of, of wars? You know? And current world relations. Yeah, well, I, I have this idealistic and maybe naive notion that if populations were scientifically literate, they would be less uh, able to be convinced that war is a beneficial thing, you know. Uh, they would, uh, one of the attributes of science thinking is skepticism. They would be skeptical 
about stories that would in, might inflame them uh, to violence, they would say, where's the proof? They would be, uh, there, there's you know, good examples from, uh, from the daily newspapers today that I think are critical, skeptical, and uh, uh, population w uh, will be harder to uh, convince that war is a, is, is a way to solve a problem. What do you think the effect of the world relations now, though, is on their acceptance of scientific development and the, I guess, rise or decrease in scientific literacy? Well, I'm sure, not sure I got the whole question. What do you think the effect of current world relations upon, is upon the rise or decrease in scientific literacy? Do you think it's helping more people to be Yeah, I think that, uh, I think that uh, two or three, three years ago, there was a conference in Budapest called the World Science Conference. It was amazing. There were thousands of scientists there from all over the world, really, from developed countries, from developing countries, from third world countries. Uh, and uh, first of all, scientists have the knack of communicating. Now, you know, the official uh, international language of science is broken English, uh, but uh, that's, that's what's used. But it's amazing how scientists, even from different disciplines, can sit down together uh, from different parts of the world, different cultures, and communicate. So that in a sense, science is a, is a culture of its own. It's the only universal culture that's understood in all parts of the world. And uh, I think that's a good starting point for uh, uh, developing a more universal science literacy. I mean, again, you're optimistic in all of this, and uh, today in developing countries, uh, you're often uh, a fifth grade education is a unique thing, but a fifth grade education, then if, we're gonna, if that's gonna be all there is, it ought to be a decent fifth grade education. And gradually, especially with internet technologies of that kind, uh, one should pay attention to increasing that education all over the world. I, you know, that's, in a way, it's again a, a optimistic. Uh, I remember once somebody made the uh, claim that no two countries that had McDonald's ever went to war with one another. I don't know if that's still true, <laughs> but it was true. It was true as of some years ago when whoever it was made this claim. So in, a, in a way, I, I do think that. Uh, if you sh if you if this scientific culture that's so universal is now widely respected and uh, and utilized by peoples of the world, you'll have a you're better chance of of uh, a more peaceful and more abundant and uh, world with uh, less of the uh, enormous gaps between the rich and the poor, which is in fact one of the negative issues of technology as it's used now. If you have access, you become richer, and if you don't have access, you become poorer. And that's the, that's the, the problem we have to face. Thank you. Uh, my question pertains to what some scientists are referring to as the hydrogen economy and fuel cell technology. And uh, specifically, I'd like to know why, what you think are the major obstacles uh, in achieving those and uh, why it's kind of seems to be on the back burner. I have my own theories on that, but I'd kind of like to hear what you think about that issue. Well, I'm not an expert, and uh, you really have to know more about it than I do. I, I do, uh, you know, read the uh, efforts of uh, combinations of the Department of Energy and the automobile people to look at fuel cell drivers and so on. And I think there's, uh, the technology is advancing rapidly. Obstacles to deployment of this technology are another issue. And that may involve uh, political things or economic things that are over my salary level. So I'm not really sure I can help you on that. If you have a good theory, <laughs> follow it up. <laughs> Publish. <laughs> What's that? You want to hear my theory? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> After the meeting. Um, something maybe from a different perspective, but in search for the God's particle, um, we make as a society a lot of inventions that greatly benefit humanity. But maybe at times, maybe we are misimplying some of these inventions and 
we are actually on a collision course with the God's principles. You just mentioned earlier the warming effect where maybe our science is going in wrong directions. We are about to start a new war. We applied, you know, the greatest invention, atomic power, two times already. We dropped two bombs, you know. Where lies the responsibility of scientists to control the event so that it will truly benefit the humanity rather than put us on a collision course with what maybe God did not intend to do? <clears throat> well, you have a, that's a $64 million question <laughs> in that uh, scientific responsibility uh, is a personal one. So you have a decision if uh, you might say, uh, uh, I will not work for, uh, uh, on weapons. You don't have to work on weapons. It's a democratic society. Uh, some, I don't know, what fraction of the scientists in, say, the developed countries work on military things. Sometimes the military things you work on uh, look, uh, look benign. They're defensive in some ways. You know, how to protect against, say, biological warfare. So you have issues of that kind. Uh, uh, maybe the most evil you could have done is to work for tobacco companies because they kill a thousand people a day. It uh, makes Genghis Khan look like Mother Teresa. Uh, so you have a lot of these personal decisions you can make about what, what you want to do. Um, science itself is very neutral. It, it, science is a search for truth. Uh, and that's exactly the point, the, the major point I want to make is that it's the utilization of science that is the issue you're raising. How do we use the science that we know, how, the knowledge we know? And uh, that utilization, I think, uh, depends, is not up to the scientist anymore except that he can uh, answer questions about what the, you know, the technical questions about this particular piece of science that he's doing. So the, uh, again, I think that uh, in democratic societies, and most of our world is, is democratic, and maybe hopefully more will be in the future, uh, a popular consensus is what should govern the decision as to what's useful and advances humanity and what is not useful and would in fact detract from the well-being of humanity. This is a decision that, uh, uh, I think has uh, is often now made by you know leaders, you know with the best advice they can, but um, and with all the economic and social and political Im inputs to the thing, but I think it's uh, there ought to be more of a consensus on this, and this can only come by an educated public. Yeah, that's a, yeah. Once upon a time, there was an office in Washington called the Office of Technological Assessment. And its purpose was just to do what you said, is to assess uh, new technologies, to try to see whether when you use them for one thing which you think is useful, it turns out to have a negative effect. That's a very serious problem. Uh, for some reason, uh, Congress uh, uh, voted the Office of Technology Assessment out and saved a hundred dollars a month or something or whatever it was, you know, peanuts. And that's a pity because I think we do need assessment. At the moment, scientists, when they're dealing with things like the biologists, make their own decisions sort of com in a community and say, we don't want to work on this particular stuff. We don't understand it well enough. But, uh, but you do have the, the obligation to assess new technologies to make sure they don't have negative side effects. You know, there's a famous case of hairsprays and suddenly we were losing our ozone. We didn't know about that. When we learned about it, we stopped the hairsprays and that uh, is already having some beneficial effects. I want to thank those of you who are the uh, steadfast and hearty ones who have remained for questions, but I thought it was a really rare opportunity for us to listen to really literally one of the world's most well-renowned scientists, and I have known Leon for well over 20 years, and one of his characteristics is extraordinary generosity, and so uh, I want to thank 
you, Leon, for willing, your willingness to take the questions, and I know you probably have others. Uh, we have two very brief presentations that I ask those of you who are here if you'd be kind enough to stay for, and they're both in honor of Dr. Letterman. Uh, the first, uh, it is a great pleasure for me to introduce a very key figure in local government, and that is the chairman of the Kane County Board, Mr. Mike McCoy, who uh, has a, 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 a gift to give Leon, a very special one. Mike is a, a University of Illinois engineering graduate. He is now serving his second term as chairman of the Kane County Board. Uh, he's had a, an amazing list of accomplishments in our area, but probably one of the most critical is the role that he played, and actually his family before him, in acquiring large tracts of open space throughout Kane County to be used by future generations for recreational areas. He has also overseen major technological uh, advances and projects in our county, and we will all profit from his leadership. Uh, and his vision for years and years to come. So we thank Mike for being here and for being a part of this lecture. He did not have to do that. He could have come in at 8 o'clock, uh, but he didn't. And so I think it's a real testament to his interest in technology and science and education that he is here. It is a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, Chairman Mike McCoy, who has come this evening to make a presentation to Dr. Letterman as a unique tribute from the Kane County Board. Mike. Thank you, Dr. Marshall. We, we at Kane County thought it was about time that uh, we recognized Dr. Letterman as, a, as probably, we're pretty sure, our, our, uh, our only uh, Nobel laureate ever to reside in the county and one of our most uh, famous citizens. And I think his contributions to the world are pretty well documented. I have to say it's a little intimidating to present, uh, to make a presentation to a Nobel laureate, but I'm going to go forward with this anyhow. Uh, but we'd also like to recognize and acknowledge um, his commitments to the local community, which are many, and I think what stands out to us are his commitments to education um, and to youth. And with that, I will just read a resolution of appreciation which we passed at our last board meeting. Resolution of appreciation and appreciation of Leon Letterman. Whereas Leon Letterman was the director of Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory from 1979 until 1989 and is currently resident scholar at the Illinois Mathematics and Science Academy, as well as the Pritzker Professor of Science at the Illinois Institute of Technology in Chicago. And whereas Leon Letterman is a member of the National Academy of Sciences and has received numerous awards, including the National Medal of Science, the Elliott Crescent Medal of the Franklin Institute, the Wolf Prize in Physics, the Nobel Prize in Physics, and the Enrico Fermi Prize. And whereas Leon Letterman served as a founding member of the High Energy Physics Advisory Panel and the International Committee for the Future Accelerators and has been awarded 36 honorary degrees, including awards from institutions in the United States, England, Italy, Finland, Brazil, Mexico, Russia, China, and Argentina. And whereas Leon Letterman has worked tirelessly to improve science education and was instrumental in the founding of the Illinois Mathematics and Science Academy and the Teachers Academy for Math and Science. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Kane County Board that it hereby extends its sincerest appreciation to Leon Letterman for his unselfish dedication to the advancement of human knowledge. Congratulations. <laughs> and just, one, just one other thing, as, as it says in our thing, he's, he's received awards and certificates and degrees from all over the world, but one thing we're pretty sure he doesn't have is a Kane County sweatshirt. <laughs> so we'll give you that too. I invite two colleagues to come up to the stage quickly, if they would, Dr. Judy Shepler and Dr. Alvin Tullestrup, if you would, as well. Um, and you notice something up here covered by a sheet. Uh, July 15th, 2002, was Leon Letterman's 80th birthday, and many of us at the Academy tried to think of what to give someone who had almost every plaque imaginable on his wall, plus uh, a Nobel Prize pin that I understand he wears on his pajamas occasionally. And we decided 
that probably the best thing we could do is write to all of Leon's friends, uh, most of whom are the most important scientists and science educators in the country, and say, we want to write a book uh, and dedicate it to Leon uh, and have as his legacy uh, a book on science literacy for the 21st century. And would you write a chapter? And we're not going to pay you, but would you please write a chapter for this book? Uh, everybody said yes. And on, uh, on our gala of IMSS's 15th anniversary this spring, we gave Leon a, a galley copy of the proof of the book. Uh, but we received the, the book this week. Uh, and so we are officially unveiling uh, Science Literacy for the 21st Century, chapters of which have been written by Leon's friends in honor of his birthday. They had to keep this completely confidential until last spring. Um, one of the, uh, the agreements with the publisher is we would, they would pro uh, provide the galley proof if when we told Leon about the book, he would write the epilogue. So it's unusual that this is a book in his honor, but he has also written a chapter. So we're going to unveil the book tonight, and uh, Leon and uh, others will be here to uh, sign it uh, as well, those of us who participated in it. And again, thank you so much for being here this evening and for staying for these celebrations. Please join us for a reception out in the common area. Thank you.